Scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Long ago, in many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the word of the Lord. So it's my pleasure and honor to invite up our guest speaker this morning, uh, Pastor Kwan. He's been a good friend of mine, a mentor of mine, uh, going all the way back to my high school days, back at Rexdale Alliance Church. Uh, he spent some time teaching English in East Asia, and now he's back here uh, working for the Ministry of Health in Ontario. So let's invite him up and have him open up the Word of God for us. Well, good morning, and I'll say uh, Happy New Year to you all, even though we're in the middle of January. I see you're still celebrating Christmas. So it was in the fall of 2020 that I came to speak with you, and I shared about our adventures uh, coming back to Canada from Morocco when COVID started, and a lot has happened since then. Now, some of you may remember that uh, my wife and I, um, we were teaching English in, in China, and we had to return because of COVID. Uh, well, last year, 2021, uh, we thought about going back to China, but it was just too difficult to get a visa. So we decided to stay in Canada, and I was teaching online. Um, this was about a 12 or a 13 hour time difference. And um, so it was difficult. And so we decided to uh, leave our company. And I tried to find a job again in ministry. I used to be a pastor before that. And I sent my resume to a few churches but none were interested. And it was a difficult time for us readjusting back to Canada. And then finally, a ministry was interested. It was the Ministry of Health. Well, they were looking for, for COVID contact tracers, someone to call those who have been exposed to COVID. Like, let's say you went to a restaurant and then later turned out someone was uh, in the restaurant was positive or your friends or family members were positive. Uh, so I would call the, those who were exposed to them and tell them what they need to do, whether it's to be tested or to be quarantined, if they're not vaccinated. Well, I applied and I got the job and they hired a whole bunch of us and um, it was supposed to be for a two month contract, but then they extended it to the end of March. Now, ironically, um, during this surge, we've been less busy than before, right? Because um, before the surge, there was a case manager, that's like a registered nurse who would call the, uh, the case, the positive person, and then get from him or her all the contacts, like the family members or the uh, people outside the home they've been in touch with. So she would collect that information, give it to the contact tracers, and then the contact tracers would call the, uh, the contacts. But because of the search, the case manager would tell the case, okay, your whole family's quarantined, okay? Uh, you call your contacts yourself, right? So that leaves us, the contact tracers, with not much to do in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but then they found some other uh, role, some other task for us to do. So anyways, your pastor, Pastor Tim, was kind enough to uh, let me speak at uh, your church again. And I thought, uh, uh, I thought about what should I speak on? And what would be a good topic? So like any good Sunday school answer, the answer is Jesus. No matter the question, the answer is Jesus. And so I came across this powerful quote about Jesus from John MacArthur. And let me bring up the PowerPoint. And MacArthur says about Jesus, he never practiced medicine, and yet he healed more broken hearts than doctors have healed broken bodies. This Jesus Christ is the star of astronomy, the rock of geology, the lion and the lamb of zoology, 
the harmonizer of all discords and the healer of all diseases. And throughout history, great men have come and gone, yet he lives on. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave could not hold him. This is our Christ, the preeminent one. And he is the theme of the epistle to the Hebrews. He dominates the book from one end to the other. So today I'll be speaking on Behold, Jesus, the Son of God, from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. I, I had taught a Sunday school course on the book of Hebrews last year, and I myself was blessed from my study of it, and so I hope you will be too this morning. Now let me give you some background to the text, to the, to the book first, um, in terms of the author, okay, the author of the Hebrews is unknown. Now we're used to having the author identify himself in the uh, epistles. For example, Paul in his letters, he would write at the beginning, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, or James would write at the beginning of his letter, James, a servant of Jesus. Or Peter would say, Peter, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is not found at the beginning of the book of Hebrews. And so scholars think it could be Paul or Barnabas or Silas or Apollos or Luke or uh, Philip or Priscilla or Aquila or Clement of Rome. Um, these have all been suggested by scholars. So we're not really sure who the author is. Now, when was it written? Well, if you go through the book of Hebrews, you see that the writer talks a lot about the, the priesthood and animal sacrifices in the present tense as if it was still happening. Yes, so now since the Romans came and they destroyed the temple in AD 70 and sacrifices ceased, the letter must have been written prior to that date. And so it's believed that it was written around 67 to 69 AD. Okay, now who is the audience? Whom, who is it written to? Well, it's called the Book of Hebrews because it's written primarily to a Jewish community, right? hence the title Hebrews. And so how do we know this? Well, the focus is on the Levitical priesthood and the sacrifices. There's no reference to Gentiles at all. So these Hebrews were uh, two groups, primarily converts to Christ, but also probably a number of unbelievers in their midst. And those have not yet made a full commitment of faith to Christ. Now, purpose, why was it written? Well, the letter was written to encourage the believers who were undergoing great difficulty, great persecution. And many of them were being tempted to turn back to Judaism. Now, you can imagine growing up in a Jewish town, many generations of Jewish people, many traditions. Now, if you come to Christ, okay, people will not want to deal with you. Right? They, want to, they don't want to do business with you. They ignore you socially. Your own family may even disown you. So the letter was written for a couple reasons. Okay, first of all, to encourage the believers, the Jewish believers, in the midst of their persecution. And secondly, to warn, warn believers and unbelievers that you cannot remove Jesus from God's redemptive plan. Don't go back to the Old Testament law and customs. Jesus is the center. Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is essential. He is not a departure from Judaism. He is the fulfillment of it. Okay, and then finally, the theme of the book. So the writer was emphasizing the superiority of Jesus. Jesus is superior as our great high priest. He is superior over everything, over Judaism, over Moses, over Joshua, over the prophets, over angels, over Old Testament priests and the sacrificial system. Jesus is superior. So let's get to the chapter 1, verse 1 and 3, and let me just read you this passage again. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Okay, let's go back to verse 1 and 2. Okay, it says here, in the past. So at the very beginning, okay, there's a connection between the Old Testament prophets and the Son of God. Right, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in his last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. So God used to speak to the Israelites through the prophets like Moses or Elijah or Isaiah. But now Jesus is the continuation of that conversation. He's the final word in that conversation. And the writer calls him the Son, meaning the Son of God. So what are the implications of Jesus being the Son of God? Well, the writer is going to tell us seven wonders about Jesus from verses 2 to 3 alone. And first of all, uh, verse 2 goes on to say that whom he appointed heir of all things. Okay, whom he appointed heir of all things. So what is an heir? Well, an heir is the one who receives the inheritance, the, the money, the property, the valuables from the parents when the parents pass away. Now, in biblical times, it was the firstborn son who received the inheritance. If not everything, then most of it. Well, this past week, I was trying to look up uh, how much would Prince Charles inherit when the, when the queen dies. And one article said it was billions, right? billions. Now, he's already a rich man. He's a multimillionaire. And um, here's a picture of a map of the UK. Um, the ones in the blue there at the bottom, that's uh, what Prince Charles already owns. And the red is what the queen owns, or the crown owns. Okay? So he'll inherit all of those one day. Now, in terms of uh, property alone, he will be heir to castles and palaces and country homes and townhouses and city apartments worth billions of dollars altogether. You have Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle in London, and then Sangerham. Um, it's a country estate about 20,000 acres, and then Balmoral Castle in Scotland, and so on. Okay, billions of dollars. Now, what does God own? He owns everything, all of creation. Everything in the universe, everything on the earth, everything in the entire universe. And we're told that here in verse 2, that God has appointed Jesus as heir of all things. Okay, he's not just heir of uh, castles and palaces, but of er everything. And one day the kingdom of our God will be the kingdom of his Christ. Okay, in the Psalms, God said that his son Jesus would be heir to all that he possesses. Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 and 8. It says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy, hill, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. And seven wonders about Jesus from Hebrews 1 verses 2 to 3. First of all, he is the heir of all things. So, he has spoken to us by his son. He is the heir of all things. And then the end of verse 2 says, And through whom also he made the universe. Okay, through whom also he made the universe. Okay, so now we're told more about the son. Something that's not said about the prophets. Jesus is the one through, through whom God has created the entire universe. Now, the writer could have used the word cosmos, meaning the physical universe, but instead he uses another word that can be translated as ages, making Jesus the creator of the 
ages of all concepts of time and space and force and action and matter, Jesus made it all, every bit of it, without effort. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God created, he spoke things into being. God said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, let there be sky, and there was sky. Let there be water, let there be land, and so on. And these things were created. God spoke things into being. So what comes out of our mouth when we speak? Words. And what comes out of God's mouth when he speaks? His word. And who is Jesus Christ? He's the living word of God. And John chapter 1 tells us specifically that Jesus is the creator through whom all things have been made. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 3, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus, he created time and space out of nothing. He is the creator through whom all things have been created, from the smallest atom to the largest stars and galaxies in the universe and everything in between from DNA to the smallest microorganisms to more complex life forms such as mantis shrimps and strange fishes and hummingbirds you know, to armadillos and aardvarks and pandas and platypuses. He created them all to, of course, human life. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Seven wonders about Jesus. First of all, he's the heir of all things. Secondly, he is the creator of all things. Through He made the universe. And then thirdly, verse 3 tells us, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. The radiance of God's glory. The radiance means the, the brightness. Okay, he's the brightness of the glory of God. Just as the, the rays from the sun reaches the earth and give light and warmth to the earth, Jesus is the glorious light of God, shining into our hearts, giving us life and growth. The brightness of the sun is the same nature of the sun. Okay? It can't be separated from the sun. And so it's the same with Christ. He's the same nature as God. Now, yet the brightness of the sun is not the sun itself. So in one sense, Jesus is God. But in another sense, he's a distinct person from God the Father and from God the Holy Spirit. But we don't have time to get into the Trinity today. So just focusing on this verse, Jesus is the, the radiance of God's glory. And God's glory is everything excellent and beautiful and powerful and magnif magnificent about God. Okay, you see his glory in creation, whether it's the northern lights or a beautiful sunset you know, or the fall colors or from the top of a mountain, the view from the top of a mountain or the view from the Grand Canyon or in a powerful hurricane. Right, you put all these things together and not a billion times, but of infinite times more, not the, the glory of God. Now in the Old Testament, an encounter with God's glory was accompanied by awe and fear. Uh, Moses on Mount Sinai could not see God's full glory. And Isaiah, when he saw the Lord on the throne, he felt himself, himself disintegrating and falling apart at the seams. And we humans, we cannot see God's glory fully in our earthly bodies and live. But this verse says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory. For everything that makes God glorious is in Jesus. So Jesus is the brightness of God's essence made known to us. We would never know what God is like if we didn't have Jesus to look at. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus, he's the radiance of God's glory, 
He can transmit that light into your life and into my life so that we literally radiate the glory of God. It's a dark world that we live in. There's the darkness of injustice, the darkness of disease and death, and of course the darkness of sin. We humans were blinded by our greed, by our appetites, by our godless passions. And it's into this dark world that God sent his beams of light, like the sun sends its rays. The beams of God is Jesus Christ. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 tells us, For God, who said, Let light shine of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So Jesus is the heir of all things. He made all things. He made the universe. He is the radiance of God's glory. And then taking this idea of the deity of Christ even further, the author of Hebrews says in verse 3, he says, the Son is the exact representation of God's being. Okay, and this term, exact representation, has to do with a, uh, a stamp, you know, a mark that's made by a seal, as you can see here. So when the wax dries, you have the exact imprint of the original. Okay, and what it means is that Jesus is the exact representation, the exact reproduction of God. Not that he was created, but he's exactly like God. Okay? Now, it says that his exact representation of God's being, and the word being means his substance or, or essence. Okay? Jesus is, in, in substance, is God exactly. He's the perfect essence of God, the personal imprint of God in time and space. In other words, Jesus conveys the nature of God perfectly. And here's what Paul says about Jesus in the book of Colossians. He says, in chapter 1, he says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In verse 19, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. In Colossians 2, verse 9, he says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And so all the fullness of God is in Jesus. All his essence, his substance, his nature is in Jesus. Now, we humans, we can't fully comprehend what the nature of God is. We've been given some insights in his word. But to understand it fully, you know, we can't go there. But we're told that Jesus is this exact representation of God's nature. So we're left with the conclusion from these verses that is that Jesus is God. There's no other way to understand it. Okay, we can't say this of any other human, of any prophet. Philip asks Jesus, show us the Father, and that would be enough. And Jesus replied, don't you know that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So do you want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. And Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature. So we said earlier that he's the creator of all things, but then verse 3 also tells us that he is sustaining all things by his powerful word. Okay, so Jesus, the word of God, creates, but he also sustains and holds things together. Right? He's not a deist. No, that's a God who creates and then leaves his creation alone. And that's like a clockmaker who makes a clock and then he sells it and he doesn't get involved anymore. Okay, that's what a deist is. Okay, God is not like that. Okay, Jesus is not like that. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he made something out of nothing and then he also makes sure that that something doesn't become nothing. In the very word of God, Jesus Christ, he holds the universe together by his powerful word. Things don't happen in our universe by accident. They didn't begin by an accident. They don't end by an accident. And things are not happening now by accident. 
because Jesus Christ is sustaining the universe. And the reason the universe is a cosmos instead of a chaos, the reason it's ordered and reliable instead of being erratic and unpredictable is because Jesus Christ is sustaining it. So just like you, you know, I can give in to fears easily, you know, fear of COVID, fear of family members getting sick, you know, fear of losing my job, fear of not getting another job, fear of growing old, etc. But if the universe is held together by God's powerful word, is your life held together by his powerful word? Right? Is God holding you together? Is your life a part of that universe? Yes. Okay? If he's holding the universe together, he's holding us together. Okay? He is the one holding it together, all together, not us. Okay, we think we have to be in control. We're searching for control and we can't find it, so we stress out. But we are not in control and we never will be. But we know the one who's in control. The one who created the universe and is now holding it together, sustaining it by the power of his word. And we can trust him. So I, I encourage all of you to take your fears and lay them at the feet of Jesus and say to him, Lord, now I'm done worrying about all these things that may or may not happen. I'm going to trust in you because I believe that you hold my life together. And I believe that you know all the hairs on my head. And I believe that you know every issue, every concern, every need that I have. So these verses remind us that even though Jesus is fully human, he's also fully God, fully God the all-powerful creator God, who holds things together and will sustain us and keep us. Behold the Son of God. And so when we pray to Jesus, when we pray in the name of Jesus, we are praying in the name of the one who holds all things together. So the fifth thing is he sustains everything by his word. So next, uh, we're told about Jesus in verse 6. It says, after he had provide, provided purification for sins. Okay, so here we're reminded that Jesus cleansed us. He purified us from our sins. He washed our sins with his forgiveness. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But Jesus died for us to pay for those wages or the penalty of our sins. And if we accept his sacrifice for us and believe that he died for us, it frees us from the penalty of sin. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, however, however, Hebrews 10, 26 says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, that is, if we keep on rejecting Jesus, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Okay, so if you reject Jesus, you know, there's nothing in the universe that can take away your sins. Okay, this is a serious warning. So turn away from your sins, turn back to Jesus, and receive his forgiveness and his purification. That is the sixth wonder about Jesus from this verse. He provided purification for sins. Okay, and then we're told, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. There's two key phrases in this section. Okay, sat down and right hand. Okay, and sat down... This term, it doesn't literally mean, you know, after Jesus went up to heaven, he just sat down and has never gotten up again. But it's a term to refer to rest. It means that after making purification for sins, Jesus rested from that work. Because the work of salvation is done. It's finished. Now, you and I, we don't have to do anything to add to our salvation. There's no more working for our salvation. You know, there's no purgatory. Jesus has done it all. He has paid it all. We just need to trust in what he has done for us on the cross. 
So he sat down, it means he rested because it was finished. And now he's sitting at the right hand of God, praying to the Father for us. Okay, and then the second term, the right hand. Okay, right hand is meant to convey the idea that Jesus holds a place of honor and power at the throne of God. You know, he has a place of supreme authority. Uh, 1 Peter 3.22 says, Jesus, who has gone into, the he- into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in, in submission to him. He has a place of power and authority. And I also think uh, right hand has the idea when we talk about the, uh, the boss's right hand man. You know, the boss's right hand man, what do we mean by this? Well, it means if you want to get to the boss, you have to go through his right hand man, right? The right hand man can speak on behalf of the boss, okay? And he can also speak to us on the boss's behalf. He can speak to the boss on our behalf. He, Jesus, is at the right hand of God. He has the ear of the Father, and he continues to pray to the Father for you and me. In the seventh wonder, he sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. He finished the work of salvation. He's now ruling in power and authority and is our access to the Father is through him. So in summary of these first three verses of Hebrews chapter 1, okay, the author was concerned about his readers being drawn back to Judaism. And he's making the case that Jesus is superior to the Old Testament prophets. The prophets are wonderful, but they cannot compare to Jesus for seven reasons. First of all, not one of them is heir of all things. Okay, not one of them created the universe. Not one of them sustains. Uh, sorry, not one of them sustains the universe by His word, and okay, not one of them is the radiance of God's glory. Not one of them is the exact representation of God's nature. Not one of them provided purification for sins, and not one of them sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. Behold, this is your Jesus. This is the Son of God. And I hope your response is, wow, Lord Jesus, I want to worship you. Now, I saw this quote recently, and I modified it a bit. And it says, if you look at the problems in this world, you'll be distressed. If you look inwardly, you will be depressed. But if you look at Jesus, you'll be impressed, and your heart will be at rest. So let's come to this Jesus now in prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we worship you. You made this universe, you sustained all things by the power of your word. You purified us from your sins. You sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Uh, You are his exact representation. You are the radiance of the Father's glory. Uh, May your light shine in any area of our lives, Lord, that is darkened, and bring us light and hope so that we can be light and hope to those who are around us. Thank you for giving us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And we pray this in your powerful name. Amen.